Other colonial paramilitary armed groups later combined with the Hausa Constabulary. The Royal Niger Company created a constabulary in 1886 to provide military and police security in areas where the company traded and exercised administrative control. Sir Ralph Moore created a third paramilitary group called the Oil River Irregulars in 1891. They were later renamed the Niger Coast Constabulary. When the Royal Niger Company's Royal Charter was revoked in 1900, the Lagos Constabulary, Royal Niger Constabulary, and Niger Coast Constabulary were amalgamated into the West African Frontier Force, WAF. The Royal Niger Constabulary became the Northern Nigeria Regiment of the WAF and the Northern Nigerian Police Force, and the Niger Coast Constabulary formed the Southern Nigeria Regiment of the WAF and Southern Nigerian Police Force, along with units of the Royal Niger Constabulary stationed in Southern Nigeria. The Lagos Constabulary became the Lagos Battalion of the WAF. The WAF was renamed the Royal West African Frontier Force RWAFF in 1928. The Nigerian Regiment of the RWAFF then underwent several changes in nomenclature over the next 35 years in its lineal evolution to the modern-day Nigerian Army. In 1956, it was renamed the Queen's Own Nigeria Regiment following the state visit of Queen Elizabeth II to Nigeria in that year. It was renamed the Royal Nigerian Military Force in 1959, then the Royal Nigerian Army when Nigeria became independent in 1960, and finally the Nigerian Army when Nigeria became a republic in 1963. Although British
in modern day crossover states, British army recruiters did not regard men from southeastern Nigeria as good soldiers for several reasons. For one, British recruiters believe that most of the local tribes are too impatient for any form of authority to submit voluntarily to military discipline. Igbos ranked high on the list of ethnic groups that recruiters regarded as undesirable military candidates. In military eyes, Igbos could not be trusted to obey orders. Constant armed revolts and other protest movements against British authority in Igbo land gave his people a reputation for being headstrong and rebellious. Placing guns in their hands and training them in how to use them was a very dangerous proposition. The feeling of antipathy was mutual. Constant British military assaults in Igbo land did not make the area a friendly place for British recruiters, and Igbos were not favorably disposed to joining an army that was in the habit of machine gunning their families and burning their towns and villages to the ground. The language barrier between British military recruiters and South Easterners also made it difficult for any affinity to develop between them. The recruiters did not speak any South Eastern languages and South Easterners could not speak Hausa. It was much safer to recruit such Southerners from non-combat roles as carriers, bandsmen and drummers. However, a large number of Igbos underwent Western education and became literate. British recruiters were almost forced to recruit them out of necessity to serve in technical roles such as clerks, mechanics and signalers. This created two conflicting stereotypes of South Easterners as being educated and technically adept, but far too soft nature to be warriors, and of Northerners as brave and disciplined fighters, but not educated or intellectually adroit. The natives themselves absorbed these stereotypes in many ways that paved the way for future conflict between them. Northern soldiers had little respect for the martial credentials of their southern colleagues who did not carry guns or fight, but instead spent their working lives reading documents, reading and counting stock. They regarded these literate southerners, especially Igbos, as too articulate and erudite to be warriors. Since the southeast in particular could not provide a large pool of combatant soldiers, British had to recruit from elsewhere. The second marker for army recruitment was proximity to Hausa land or the ability to quickly learn to speak Hausa. Lugard claimed that the pagan Gwaris, Kedaras and other tribes yield to none in bravery. They all speak Hausa and I hope to enlist many. Lugard's primary concern was to dissolve the army's monoreligious character. Yet, he had little interest in making it a nationally representative army that reflected Nigeria's ethno-regional composition. He informed the colonial office, It is, in fact, my desire to make the West African frontier force as far as possible a Hausa-speaking pagan force. The third way for an ethnic group to end the tag of martial race was to demonstrate a history of resistance to the Sokoto Caliphate. Since the Caliphate was, in British eyes, the zenith of military and political achievements in the area, they regarded ethnic groups that successfully resisted its raid and occupation as natural warriors. These factors gave the Hausa neighboring ethnic groups an advantage, but made it difficult to recruit ethnic groups from faraway locations in southern Nigeria. The thieves who lived in the lower parts of northern Nigeria had fought off frequent slave raids from the Caliphate, maintained their independence and refused to be converted to Islam. Such attempted invasions made them resistant to strangers and they became feared for attacking intruders with their mysterious and deadly poisoned arrows. British authorities referred to them as a derogatory house word, Munshi, and regarded Thieve land as dangerous bandit country. Thieves acquired a reputation among the British for being truculent, a most intractable people who have proved themselves aggressive and inimical to a degree towards an effort to establish law and order. The thieves fulfill these stereotypes. One month after British declared the protectorate over northern Nigeria in 1900, they attacked an army British patrol that was installing telephone lines on their land. In the past, they had also attacked the Royal Niger Company's trading station in Thieveland and murdered two of its agents causing the company to close all but one of its trading stations in Thieveland at Abinti. In January 1906, they sacked and burned the remaining factory at Abinti. 
Although these attacks brought British military reprisals against the thieves, it also made them, in British eyes, a potential warrior race and targets for military recruitment. In his 1906 annual reports, Lugard reported to the colonial office, the Munshis are stated to be an extremely fine race, fearless and independent and very industrious. In 1923, 11 out of the 3,000 soldiers in the army were thieves, but by World War II, the army had 6,000 thief fighters. Thereafter, the thief became synonymous with the army. They remain one of the most heavily represented ethnic groups in the army's infantry units. In 1950, the commander of the Northern Nigerian Regiment issued recruiting instructions. We only want men of Northern origin and the thieves from Benue. British colonial authorities also recruited large numbers of the thieves neighboring ethnic groups such as the Idoma, Igala and Jukun and other groups such as the Bachama, Tarok, Dakakari, Nupe and Kataf who either lived on the periphery of Hausa land and resisted conquest by Sukutu Caliphate or who spoke Hausa in addition to their indigenous language. The guards desire to make the army a Hausa-speaking, non-Muslim force succeeded, and men from this ethnic group still dominate the Nigerian army's combat units. 60% of post-independent Nigerian chiefs of army staff came from these parts of the country. This ethnic manipulation meant that for much of its history, the army tended to be an ethnic anomaly in most Nigeria. Although it is understated in the historical literature, Nigerian soldiers served with distinction and played a key role in the two world wars. Britain recruited over 20,000 Nigerian soldiers for World War I, and during World Wars I and II, they fought for Britain and gained a reputation as brave and loyal soldiers. A British soldier who fought alongside Nigerian soldiers during the World War I paid tribute to them. I hope that when my readers have read this account, they will in the future respect the fighting black man of Africa, for he has at least proved himself a man. We in England owe our Negro brother subject a great debt of gratitude for all he has done for our beloved empire. Many a native of Nigeria has trekked his last trek and fought his last fight far away from his own land for the sake of the empire. The legacy of Nigerian army participation in British wars lives on in the name of army institutions such as Dodan Barracks in Lagos, which was the government headquarters for 25 years from 1966 to 1991, and which is named after a region of Burma in which Nigerian soldiers fought. The Army's 81st and 82nd Division are named after historic West African Army divisions that fought during World War II. Some early Nigerian soldiers of the WAF acquired near-legendary status for their exploits in battle. These include Company Sergeant Major Belu Akure, the hero of a dozen fights, Private Afolabi Ibadan, and Company Sergeant Major Sumanu, who was awarded five medals. While fighting for the British Army during World War I, Afolabi carried his wounded British commander, Captain Robinson, on his back while Sumanu followed behind to shield Robinson from rare fire by his own body. Sumanu was shot and wounded, and as Afolabi turned back to help him, he too was shot. For their actions, Afolabi was decorated with the military medal and Sumanu was mentioned in dispatches. Another renowned Nigerian soldier in the WAF was Regimental Sergeant Major Chari Megumeri, who became a legend of the army. Megumeri was a Kanuri from Borno. He enlisted in 1913 and fought in both World Wars I and II. During World War I, he fought for the Germans in the Cameroons, where he was awarded the Iron Cross for bravery. He was captured by the Nigerian Regiment in 1915 and remained a prisoner of war for two years until 1917 when he volunteered for the Nigeria Regiment. He served against the Germans in East Africa and was promoted to Regimental Sergeant Major in 1928. Megumeri also fought in World War II in which he was awarded the Military Medal for fighting against the Italians and the British Empire Medal for fighting against the Japanese. He retired in 1953 after 36 years of service and was promoted to Honorary Captain in retirement. Despite his actions of gallantry, 
Nigerian soldiers were not particularly well treated in comparison with their British contemporaries. For one thing, they were paid far less than British soldiers, even though they had to carry heavier loads and baggage than British soldiers while marching. The salary of the five British officers in the Royal Niger Constabulary was more than £3,000 greater than the combined salaries of more than 500 native soldiers in the Constabulary. Native soldiers could be punished for disciplinary infractions by flogging and were forced to march barefoot. British soldiers were not so punished and had boots. Native soldiers also had to stand to attention and salute both white soldiers and civilians. Yet, British soldiers did not have to return the gesture to natives and did so only for British officers of superior rank. Britain placed a rank ceiling on the native soldiers and barred them from becoming commanding officers. They also had to perform some unpleasant mission on behalf of their British commanders. Civilians feared and resented soldiers because their presence tended to have a scorched earth effect. While marching through the countryside, British commanders often ordered native soldiers to seize crops, yams and cattle from villagers' farms in order to feed themselves. The army colonial origins and the involvement of its soldiers in the campaign of destruction caused problems for it long after colonialism ended. The fact that Nigerian soldiers helped the British to conquer and subjugate their fellow Nigerians made them feared and unpopular among the civilian population. The soldiers got the blame for the colonial army's action, but little of its benefits. They, like the civilians, were part of the same conquered African people. They obeyed orders from their British commanders without appreciating the consequences of what they were doing. They shot, invaded, and burned by order. The Sadauna of Sokoto and first indigenous premier of northern Nigeria, Sir Ahmadu Bello, said, We did not like the soldiers. They were our own people and had conquered us for strangers and defeated our people on the plain just before us. This feeling was very common all over the north. While the tactic of using Hausa soldiers to conquer other ethnic groups was successful in the colonial era, the racialized division of labor that he introduced into the army survived into the post-independence years. When Nigeria became independent in 1960, approximately three quarters of the fighting troops were northerners, while the majority of officers in the army supports and technical units such as education, ordnance, finance and signals were southerners. Less than six years after independence, Southern officers staged a military coup during which they killed four Northern soldiers. When Northern soldiers avenged the murders of their brethren six months later, it inevitably resembled an ethno-regional fratricidal battle between the Northern infantrymen and Southern officers and descended into a brutal bloodbath. This ethnic layering of the army contributed to several military coups in Nigeria during which different ethnic factions of the army turned their guns on each other and to a civil war in which over a million people died. The ethnic composition of the army remains a controversial and difficult problem with which Nigeria still grapples in the 21st century. Its effect on national stability is so serious that in make military recruitment more balanced, Nigeria still applies an ethnic quota to military recruitment and promotions. Nigeria's army and police were the country's first national institution and both are ironically older than the country itself. Although Nigerians are reluctant to admit it, the story of Nigeria is to some extent the story of its army. There are few countries where the country's faith and that of its army are tightly interwoven as Nigeria. For the first 102 years of its existence, Nigeria's army was under British command. At various points in time, the army has played different roles as conqueror, destroyer, ruler and protector of the country it is supposed to defend. Without it, Nigeria would not exist. Yet, it has a complex history, including its role as a tool that helped foreign invaders conquer its own people.